All right, welcome back to uh, Academic Agent Retrospective. You're watching episode two. And while Sadiq Khan got all the clicks, and got all the attention, um, anyone who's a true fan of this channel knows that the real villain, the, the absolute heel, the, the, the Emperor Palpatine, uh, if you want, uh, 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 all throughout the years has been the Dark Lord, Tony Blair. Now, I'm only collecting uh, videos as opposed to uh, streams um, or, you know, episodes of uh, my long running shows where I've devoted time to analysing Tony Blair, like I did on The Deepest Law and on The Cigar Stream at various times. Uh, I did a recent one, which was just called Dark Lord Watch, which you can find. Uh, I, I'm not going to be collecting those longer ones, otherwise we'd be here all day. Um, but uh, I have made a number of videos over the years uh, on Tony Blair. And unlike the City Calm ones, which were kind of a bit more ephemeral, um, these ones, if I just pull up the list a second, um, do have some... Uh, fairly important red pills in them, especially about uh, the way crime statistics uh, were changed under Blair, um, a lot of the, the the laws that Blair put in place, um, uh, stuff about immigration. Uh, I've got a, a special... I have included this kind of 40-minute uh, expose, I, expose I did on the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, Um and then, then there was a more recent topical one where he called Joe Biden an, in, an imbecile. But uh, between them, these five videos should be a good kind of York notes on uh, why we call Blair the Dark Lord. Um, incidentally, still one of the best books on this topic is The Abolition of Britain by Peter Hitchens. Just before I let you enjoy this, I'll mention again, all of this week, uh, I'm running this uh, deal on the academic agency if you use the code retro you'll get a hundred pounds off any bundle um so that is the uh the, the current uh, uh deal that we have as a tie-in to this little retrospective uh series that we're doing um let me know if you're enjoying this uh let me know if you found uh this channel through one of the videos featured uh in these retrospectives um and I'm hoping that it's going to, um, you know, make those newer members feel like they, they're they a little bit more caught up. Uh, now, for those older fans who've been around since the beginning, well, it'll be a nice trip down memory lane. Hope you enjoy the show. Please welcome the Shadow Secretary for Home Affairs for Labour, Tony Blair. So let's start with our first question. It comes from Alison Samuels. Where are you, Alison? You've got the motto, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. Is there a real policy behind that, or is it just a slogan? There is a policy behind it. What I believe that you require is to get away from this idea that you choose between either trying to prevent crime and deal with its causes, or simply punish the criminal and that you want a criminal justice system that actually works and is functioning effectively, but also a society that's prepared to act and cooperate in a much better way in preventing crime and tackling some of the underlying causes of crime and dealing with problems like the link between crime and drugs and so forth. And that's the general basis of the policy. And what we've done in each of the areas is try and put forward specific policies to back that up, for example, in relation to juvenile offenders and so forth. <laughs> I know I look a lot older, that's what being leader of the Labour Party does to you. Actually, uh, looking around, some of you look a lot older. That's what having me as leader of the Labour Party does to you. In 1994, I stood before you for the first time. And I shared with you the country's anger at crumbling school buildings, patients languishing, sometimes dying in pain, waiting for operations, of crime doubled of homes repossessed, of pensioners living in poverty. And I told you of our dismay at four election defeats and how it was not us who should feel betrayed, but the British people. That such a speech seems so dated today 
is not through the passage of time, but through progress. Recently, I have had some reason to look into crime statistics, and I have come across something that I think will be of interest to anyone who is British watching this. On my last video, which was on Enoch Powell, I briefly showed this graphic, which is the UK homicide rate. Quite a few people in the comments wondered why the rate takes such a sharp dive after 2003. Now, I figured casually that these must have been the effects of Tony Blair's signature tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime agenda, one of the supposed successes of his time in charge. We have been told for a decade now that violent crime in this country is declining, even to the point where some are wondering how and why. So let's go back to this homicide graph and try to figure out what happened in 2003 to cause the reversal of the trend of the previous two decades. There are in fact two reasons for the sudden reversal. The first is that in 2003, serial killer and psychopath Dr. Harold Shipman was convicted for the murder of 172 people, which created a large spike in the statistics. Obviously, he did not kill all 172 people in that year, but that's how it is recorded, and so it created an anomaly. However, there is a second and much more sinister reason. We were long told about the slickness of uh, Mr. Anthony Blair and his political machine, and how adept they were at controlling the media and its narratives. How, for example, the Lord of Darkness, Peter Mandelson, fiercely micromanaged how people appeared on television and how events were reported in the newspapers. But much, much darker than this, in 2002, the Labour Party permanently changed the way crime is reported in the UK. Up until that point, crime in the UK was reported using hard data on actual arrests and convictions. However, from that point onwards, the official statistics were drawn from the British Crime Survey, which produced a graph for Blair and Mendelssohn, which looked like this. Now, the survey seeks uh, to measure the amount of crime in England and Wales by asking around 50,000 people aged 16 and over, and as of January 2009, living in private households, what the crimes uh, they experienced were in the past year. From January 2009, 4,000 interviews were also conducted each year with children aged 10 to 15 years old, although the resulting statistics remain experimental. So that means that the statistics you see quoted in newspapers like The Guardian are not hard figures, but estimates drawn from these surveys, which is a little bit like how television companies estimate viewership numbers. Now this change ostensibly came about because Labour, for some reason, wanted to count victims as opposed to total numbers of offenders. And of course, this takes a huge number of crimes out of the data. For example, as it was introduced in 2003, because only over 16 year olds could be interviewed, crimes against minors didn't count in the stats. Also, because interviews had to take place in private properties, it meant that street crime habitually would not show up in the numbers. And now you're starting to see why this extraordinary change in the methodology would produce a downwards trend in the data. In fact, it was explicitly designed so that because of all these caveats, it could not be compared with numbers before 2002, as we will get on to later. And of course, stuff like online crime or fraud cases, that is so-called victimless crimes, will not show up in this data either. Now, back in 2007, Professor Keen Pease, former acting head of the Home Office's Police Research Group, and Professor Graham Farrell of Loughborough University estimated in 2007 that the survey was underreporting crime by about 3 million incidents per year due to its practice of arbitrarily capping the number of crimes one can be victimised by in a given year at 5. If true, the error means that violent crime might actually stand at 4.4 million incidents per year, an 82% increase over the 2.4 million previously thought. Now, I don't know if this is true or is not true, but perhaps that is the point. So because crime is now based on an estimate, no one is quite sure exactly what the real numbers are. Hence articles like this one from last year, 
where the BBC actively wonders about what the real crime rate is. And this is where the true extent of the Orwellian nightmare of the Blair and Gordon Brown years kicks in, because it seems clear to me that they deliberately introduced the element of doubt into the equation to make it so that neither side reliably could point to the facts. And so it became a question of interpretation, always a question of one difficult to substantiate narrative against another. Post-truth did not start with Vladimir Putin or Donald Trump. Tony Blair was doing it from the minute he stepped into office. Now, before the 2010 election, as the Tories were trying to get David Cameron into office, Chris Grayling, then Shadow Secretary for Justice, decided to call Labour on this total bullshit by requesting the hard numbers of arrests and convictions. This was reported at the time in The Telegraph and by the BBC, although it appears to have made no splash at all. It is not even clear if it was even a headline on that day, on the 9th of March 2010. Now, I hunted high and low to find that data that Grayling requested, and I found it. If you're interested to go to the website, it's the House of Commons Library, and you're looking for reports DEP 2010-0589, DEP 2010-0543 and DEP 2010-0544. Just to be helpful, I've also put them into a zip file so anyone wishing to drill into this data can do so in their own time. Their contents are somewhat revealing. This is the number of male offenders from 1997 to 2008, so the entirety of the Blair years. Note that since this is done per offender rather than per victim, there can be no distortions because Harold Shipman counts as just one, not 172. Nonetheless, you can see the total number of convicted male murderers in 2008 is about 40% higher than the total number in 1997. Now, without doing any complicated formulas here to figure out the uh, rate per thousand people or anything like that, we can ask a very simple question. Was the population of England and Wales 40% higher in 2008 than it was in 1997? The simple answer is no. About 58 million people for all of the UK in 1997 and about 62 million people in 2008. So that's an increase of just around 7%. So what if we look at the overall violent uh, crime? Uh, you can see 49,153 in 1997. And we can see a general increase until we get to 80,574 in 2008. That's an increase in males convicted of violent crime of about 64%. Whichever way you try to slice or dice this, that number is bigger than the 7% increase in population. And we can see increases like this across the board. So child sex abuse offences, for example, convictions for people under 18, uh, knife crime practically doubled during the Blair years. In 1998, there were 5,542 robberies. In 2008, there were 8,475. And we can see in just London alone, which at that time was being run by Red Ken Livingstone, Robberies went from 1,358 in 1998 to 2,748 10 years later. That's pretty much double the number of convictions for robbery in the capital. Did the population of London double during that time? Well, no. It increased from 7.18 million in 1998 to 7.56 million in 2008. That's just over 5% population growth and nowhere near double. In fact, most British people who lived in London moved out and have been replaced by a mixture of young professionals and international immigrants. Tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, indeed. From the year 2000 to 2008, the total number of arrests for any offence at all went up from 1.2 million uh, to 1.4 million. That's an increase of about 17%. And you'll note again that 17% is bigger than the 7% national population growth in the same time. So what happened to Chris Grayling who flagged this up uh, in 2010? Was there a big scandal? No, he was slapped down by the ONS, that's the uh, UK Office of National Statistics, for um, making a couple of little errors and basically nobody said anything. 
And then Chris Grayling himself became the Secretary uh, for Justice under David Cameron. And as far as I can see, despite being completely aware of this, did absolutely nothing to change it during the David Cameron years. And uh, these are, this is still the way that uh, crime statistics are arrived at in the UK. So what did we learn from all of this? Well, Tony Blair was guilty not only of gaslighting the British public over the question of whether or not Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. He actively lied to us about the real numbers of crime happening on our streets. Remember, I have been looking only at the numbers of actual convictions and arrests. These were the ones that the police actually caught, so God knows how many got away with it. Till next time. And a very special thanks to Sir Percy Blakeney, The Crimson Sater, Nuri Nelson, Fonz Fonz Fonz, Graham Leggett, Ginger Bill, Michael Burt, Time Stealer, Blake Barrows, Bruno Liette, Tragic Vision, Charles Vincent, and Edward Dara. The reason I come to my conclusion is because I have very strong belief in our ancient liberties. And one of the greatest liberty that we have as Britons is that we can go about our lawful business without having proved to prove to anybody who we are. The state has no right to say to us, who are you and what are you doing? But as long as we are not breaking the law, there should be no need for the state to stop us or demand to see our papers. And if you look at the European angle of this, there is a very strong one because the continental state has historically been a top-down state and this ties in with the Napoleonic law and the civil code, that the state is powerful and the individual is there to fit in with the state. In our system, with the common law, it's always been the other way around, and that the state will only act to limit what you are allowed to do if there is good reason to do so and with the consent of your representatives in Parliament. This has made us a very free and liberal society, and I think that anything that attacks that is dangerous and makes us less free and gives the state more control over our lives, which, as a conservative, I'm not in favour of. In 2003, in his book, A Brief History of Crime, later republished under the title The Abolition of Liberty, reflecting on the number of state encroachments on the private lives of ordinary people under Tony Blair, Peter Hitchens had this to say. A very short time ago, anyone in England would have thought all these cases were comical, silly bungles by heavy-handed, inexperienced and humorless juniors without any greater significance. This kind of thing does not happen here, we would have thought. Therefore, we may safely laugh at it. And yet, this kind of thing does happen here, not by mistake, but through the conscious and deliberate actions of powerful public officials. The pattern is perceptible in these incidents which is not reassuring. It seems likely that similar prosecutions and investigations will happen with increasing frequency and seriousness. Such speech codes have been rigorously enforced on many university campuses for some time. The author, for example, has had his microphone switched off in mid-speech by student officials following baseless allegations of racism. Such officials frequently find their way into national politics, and the expansion of the universities means that many police officers, lawyers and court officials will have been exposed to, and possibly infected by, such attitudes during their education. They are now spreading into the country as a whole as the intolerant campus consensus infects the police and the prosecuting authorities. New European Union provisions under the Racism and Xenophobia Directive threaten to provide a legal basis for more official widespread persecution of certain opinions. One major purpose of this book is to warn that there is now a real threat to liberty of thought and speech in this country, a threat which cannot be lightly dismissed by any observant or alert citizen. I hope the warning will, for once, be heeded. Sadly, it was not heeded. Uh, let's see what else Hitchens has to say. I have sought to explain in this book what appears to be the driving force of the new law. It is based, like the other changes that have overturned English life since 1960, on the new secular religion of the educated elite. Socialist and collectivist in origin, it worships the welfare state. It believes neither in absolute truth nor in absolute right and wrong. 
It demands special protection for cultures and lifestyles that consciously and deliberately undermine the morality and beliefs of the older generation. It uses the grievances of activists within racial and sexual minorities as the pretext for general change. It rejects the whole idea of punishment and affects to believe in rehabilitation while failing to pursue this objective with any real consistency. It is careless of the ancient liberties of the English constitution, which it is often not heard of, preferring arbitrary group rights granted to favoured lobbies over binding restraints on the power of the state. Having taken possession of the state, it believes that government is essentially benevolent and does not need to be restrained. It is hostile to individual self-improvement by the masses, although members of the elite are permitted to improve their own lives and even to become extremely rich. It is suspicious of individual wealth and most types of property. It sympathises with the drug abuser and can see the burglar's point of view. It sees respectability and restraint as repression. It regards what remains of the police force as the army of the rich against the poor, of the morally conservative against the liberated. Now in his 10 years in power, Tony Blair passed an astonishing 26 1,849 laws in total, an average of 2,663 per year or 7.5 a day. Labour continued this madness under Gordon Brown, who broke the record in 2008 by passing 2,823 new laws, a 6% increase on his megalomania predecessor. In 2010, Labour's last year in power before handing over the reins to the Blairite social radical David Cameron, there was a 54% surge in privacy cases brought against public bodies, and the Cabinet were refusing freedom of information requests at a rate of 51%. The vast number of new laws under Labour does not count the 2,100 new regulations the EU passed in 2006 alone, which apparently is an average per year for them. Now just before he left office, Gordon Brown snuck through the 2010 Equality Act, which among other things, opened up a minefield for any private employers in this country and formally tried to end over 1,000 years of British tradition by abolishing cognatic primogeniture, which wouldn't actually be done until 2013, when socialist revolutionary, I mean conservative Prime Minister David Cameron, signed the Succession to the Crown Act. Now, of all these huge changes under Labour, many of them were in the area of criminal law, by 2008, Labour had created more than 3,600 new offences. Uh, what were some of these new laws that Labour were passing? Well, of course, a lot of them were silly red tape, naturally. Uh, they include things like creating a nuclear explosion, selling types of flora and fauna not native to the UK, such as the grey squirrel, ruddy duck or Japanese knotweed. Uh, will willfully pretending to be a barrister or a traffic warden, disturbing a pack of duck eggs when instructed not to by uh, an authorised officer, uh, obstructing workers carrying out repairs to the Dockland Light Railway, offering for sale a game bird killed on a Sunday or Christmas day, allowing an unlicensed concert in a church hall or community centre, and a ship's captain may end up in court if he or she carries grain without a copy of the International Grain Code on board. Scallop fishing without the correct boat, breaking regulation number 10 of the 1998 apple and pear grubbing up regulations, selling Polish potatoes, I mean there are tons more of these. However, there are some more serious breaches of civil liberty. One common tactic of the Blair government was to use moral panic to pass radical new legislation. For example, in 2006, he passed the Terrorism Act that overturned habeas corpus and gave the British police the right to detain anyone for any reason for 90 days. Now at the time, this got widespread public support because of the recent 7-7 bombings in London. This basically means that the police can arrest you for any reason without you necessarily having committed a crime. Do you think any of us are going to actually make it to the protests that we're trying to attend legally? I'm not going to ask those sort of, sorts of comments. We've got a job to do and, which, and we will do it. Excuse me, you missed something. 
Thank you. The operation unearthed some paper masks, scissors, and several toy soldiers. What he said was that due to the items that have been seized, we can't go on to Fairford because there might be a breach of the peace, and so you. we're going to be escorted back to London. That's what he said. This is illegal. They won't let you stop. They won't. You can try. Do you want to get up? Do you want to get up? I need to speak to. They're not letting us out. Can we go? The police are using the door against me. They're using three people. Hey, hey, hey! This is a moving vehicle. He wants to talk. He wants to talk to your senior officer. They've got five policemen cursing the door closed. They're filming me in, in legal terms. They can't do this. One area in which the Labour government used moral panic cynically to overturn long-standing common law principles was the unfortunate murder of Stephen Lawrence, which they used to eliminate the double jeopardy rule and, as per the McPherson report in 1999, put an end to colourblind policing. Here is an extract from McPherson quoted by Hitchens. Every individual must be treated with respect. Colourblind policing must be outlawed. The police must deliver a service which recognises the different experiences, perceptions and needs of a diverse society. So that's the end of equality under the law then, isn't it? And one of the things that McPherson recommends in that report, which uh, Labour then enacted, was um, how is a racial attack, as opposed to just a normal crime defined, it is if anybody uh, perceives it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the victim, any onlooker at all. Uh, if they perceive racism, then the attack is racist under the law. To underline the point that the new Labour assault on British common law was carried out by those with the vision of the United, that is, the elites against the people, check out this Brian Paddock quotation. Uh, Brian Paddock was the Deputy Commissioner of the London Met Police and now sits in the House of Lords. This is Hitchens once again. In his internet conversation, Mr. Paddock revealed a worldview that owed a good deal more to Rousseau and other revolutionaries than it did to the stolid reassurance of George Dixon. The concept of anarchism has always appealed to me, he wrote. The idea of the innate goodness of the individual corrupted by society or the system. I believe many people are forced into causing harm to others by the way that society operates. They would not behave in this way if the current system did not exist or was radically different. Other samples of this thought included, what do we do about crack and smack, especially in Brixton? Bottom line, screw the dealers, help the addicts. And do not treat all police officers as lapdogs of a corrupt capitalist system. Dogs sometimes turn on their owners. When I say that Jean-Jacques Rousseau has a lot to answer for, this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. And now in 2018, when a man is fined for a joke, and when a kid is arrested for posting the lyrics of pop records online, you can see the extent to which the United Kingdom has become a police state. Till next time. And a very special thanks to Sir Percy Blakeney, The Crimson Sater, Time Stealer, Newry Nelson, Macadamia, Rosie Alpaca, Kuzga, Holy Spatula, Bruno Liette, Tragic Vision, Michael Burt, Ginger Bill, Blake Barrows, Charles Vincent, and Edward Dara. For a significant portion of the British voting public, concern over levels of immigration has been an issue for some time. Boris Johnson's Conservative government has made some gestures towards addressing the issue by talking about their much-hyped Australian-style points-based system. Some older viewers might recognize the slogan because it was first proposed back in 2006 by none other than the spawn of Satan himself, Mr. Tony Blair. By 2006, Blair could sense the public mood turning, and indeed by 2010, that bigoted woman was enough to finish off Gordon Brown. Of course, since then, the Labour Party have thought it best to take that bigoted woman more or less as their campaign slogan with the electoral success you'd expect to match. 
The ever wily Blair, though, he has a record of saying largely contradictory statements about immigration, depending on who he's talking to. He's claimed, for example, that he did not realise how many migrants would come to the UK after opening the floodgates. But at the same time, the Daily Mail has reported that Blair cynically allowed two million migrants to come in against the rules. Blair has claimed that the failure to integrate the new arrivals has led to cultural tensions and the rise of, quote, far-right bigotry, but at the same time maintains that immigration has been good for Britain. I suppose it depends which side of his mouth he's talking out of that day, and indeed to whom he's speaking. But one thing is for certain, it was under Blair that immigration rose to unprecedented levels. Here is a graph of total immigration and total emigration. You can see that since about 2001, over 500,000 people migrate to Britain every year. That's a city about the size of Manchester coming to live here every single year. Now, when you take away the emigration from the immigration, we are left with net migration, which looks something like this. And to make things clearer, here are the Prime Ministers who are in power at certain dates. Note the drastic increase happened under Blair and then stayed there at historically high levels even after David Cameron came to power and then Theresa May after him. Uh, and indeed, if you look at Boris Johnson numbers, they are similarly high. The question is, why did Blair do this? Some people like to claim that he simply wanted to, quote, rub the right's noses in it. But I think there's a different and more practical reason. And it boils down to this study about UK pensions published by Birkbeck in 2003, which was presented in front of the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee in the same year. If we go back to the graph, we can see that it was really after 2003 that immigration started to soar. So what does this paper say? Well, it is called, quite simply, Is Immigration the Answer to the UK's Pension Crisis? Let's read the first couple of pages together. As a result of population ageing and declining fertility, the UK state pension system is unlikely to remain viable without a steady inflow of young immigrant workers from abroad. Using plausible assumptions, we show that up to 500,000 immigrant workers per annum will be needed to save the state pension system. Other things equal, a positive annual net inflow of immigrant workers is required whenever 1. The real growth rate in pensions exceeds 2.5% per annum. 2. The number of retirees exceeds 660,000 per annum. The number of deaths falls below 570,000 per annum. 4. The real growth rate in wages is below 1.5% per annum. And 5. The number of births is below 590,000 per annum. Now, let me pause here to mention a couple of things that may have escaped your attention. This study is not talking about net migration. It's talking about new immigrants coming into the country and pivotally young new immigrants who have a good chance of having more than two children. If older British people want to move to, say, Spain to become expats, well, this is not a problem because their pensions and retirements are no longer a headache for the government's utilitarian calculations. The important metrics are specifically the age and the volume of the people coming into the country. They need to be young to support the pension system and to have children. So going back to the graphs, it's not this we should be looking at, but this one. A note from 2003 onwards, it has been consistently above the 500,000 figure advocated by this paper. It has gone up and down at different times, but very, very noticeably, it has never once dipped below that line almost as if this is deliberate, a calculated policy. Now let's continue. In 1990, there was one pensioner in the UK for every four workers. By 2030, there is projected to be nearly two pensioners for every five workers. 
Furthermore, the average birth rate per female in the UK is below two. These two trends indicate that if there were no other changes, the indigenous population of the UK is aging and will eventually decline. Each subsequent generation will be smaller than the previous one, and this makes it harder to sustain a pay-as-you-go state pension system without an excessive burden being placed on each future young generation. And I'll just pause there uh, briefly to note that it's not actually the immigrants coming in in 2003 that they're concerned about. It's the child that that immigrant would have who would be, let's say, 27 in 2030. If each of those immigrants has two kids, that's two more 25 and 27 year olds in 2030 to pay for a boomer's pension when they retire. So let's continue. Ceteris paribus, the supply of labour will fall relative to capital, which in turn will raise wages relative to interest rates, the return on capital. This will encourage a substitution away from labour towards capital in the production process. The resulting capital creation, that is investment financed by borrowing or equity insurance, will increase capital per worker and hence increase labour productivity. The effect on total output and national income depends on whether the growth rate in productivity exceeds the rate of the decline in population. Unless it does, a pay-as-you-go state pension system would still not be viable. What would alter the calculation, however, would be population migration. We live in a rapidly globalising economy with increasing capital and labour mobility. The UK and also the rest of Europe are clearly very attractive places for people located outside Europe to work in. So immigration would be one key way of changing the worker pensions balance as well as helping to attenuate the growth rate in wages that would otherwise be induced by labour shortages. Population migration, whether planned or unplanned, is likely to have a dominating influence on the future demographics of the UK since immigrant populations also tend to have very high birth rates. In this article, we calculate the number of immigrants needed to preserve the viability of the UK state pension system. And then they go through um, quite a few of these uh, equations, um, which we do not need to concern ourselves uh, with. Um, and they basically show how this level of immigration will help to balance the books for the state pension system. Like I said, we don't need to concern ourselves with the ins and outs. So let's just skip ahead to the conclusion. An aging society, which is also declining because its birth rate is too low, faces stark choices if it is going to have a credible and viable pension policy. Credible pension policies have to be consistent and time consistent policies cannot pass the buck to future generations. That is, they have to exhibit intergenerational fairness. This implies that the ratio of the pension bill to the wage bill cannot rise systematically. If the next generation is smaller in number than the current generation, the current generation has to 1. accept a cut in its pension or 2. save more whilst in work or 3. work longer and retire later or 4. accept more immigration. It is highly likely that the demographics will dominate the economics over 50 years in the UK, since increases in labour productivity by themselves will not be sufficient to compensate for the combined problems of population ageing and declining fertility. It is therefore also highly likely that pensions and immigration issues will increasingly dominate the political agenda on national resource allocation over the next half century. So there it is. The Labour Party decided that it was easier to simply ship in millions of people from around the world than it was to ask some older people to take a cut in their pensions. Because that's the important thing, isn't it? That old people get their state pensions. Never mind any other costs, as Willy Wonka might say. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. No matter what Tony Blair says, he did expect immigration at this volume, and no matter what anyone else says, it was, demonstrably, a deliberate policy. Now get out. Hello everyone, and uh, welcome to this impromptu live stream. It's not going to be that long, um, and consider this a kind of preamble or introduction 
uh, for what we're going to be discussing later on on Unpopular Opinions, um, where, surprise, surprise, the Dark Lord has made yet another major uh, media appearance, and we'll be analysing that interview on The Andrew Marr Show uh, later on uh, tonight on Unpopular Opinions. But uh, before we do that, I just want, I was going to make this a video, but then I figured that uh, it, it would probably work better as a live stream because I cannot figure out how, how to capture my screen um, on, a, on a video like I can here. So let me just uh, share my screen. So you can see I'm, I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, and you can see the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. I'm going to hide my, so we're, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to, what I'm going to do on this stream is uh, if anybody sends any super chats or anything like that, I will save them uh, till the end because I can't see the, the live chat. Um, I'll just make sure people can uh, hear me. Let's have a look. Yeah, people can, uh, people can hear me. Yes. Uh, excellent. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be doing uh, is... I'm going to, I'll make that screen large so everybody can see it. I'm going to be having a look into uh, the network of NGOs behind something like the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Um, not only because it will give us an insight into just how many pies Mr. Blair has his fingers into, but also how this massive NGO grift network uh, actually works in the real world. So. Let's have a look there. So this is the, the website for the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. There's, uh, there's the Dark Lord himself. He's got a message for us and all the rest of it. I won't play any videos. And uh, obviously, the, all the stuff is about the pandemic at the moment. But then, um, you know, he's, he's helping uh, poor people in Africa. He's uh, promising less risk and more freedom. He's uh, talking about Brexit. Um, a vaccine management system for Africa, you know, all dressed in this language of uh, philanthropic partnership. That's a term you'll be getting to know quite well. Um, but let's just um, let's just go down. You can see there's Blair working with various uh, various people around the world, um, and this is the crucial bit here. So all of these sites, you'll notice, will have all of this fluff. And all of these papers and things but when you get right down to the bottom you'll see uh you know their policies their you know advisory committees tony blair's role their mission and then there's one little tab here our partners so if we click on our partners it goes through to a page like this and uh, we can see uh, his partners okay so what i'm going to do is um we're going to follow up on who each of these partners are and who is funding them, okay? So we can see there's the African Center for Economic Transformation. There's uh, various African government partners who are directly in contract with Tony Blair Institute. So there's his, um, you know, millions of, uh, backhand, millions of pounds of backhanders coming from various African dictators, in other words. Um, there's AGRA. The Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. That doesn't sound dystopian or anything. There's the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL. We'll be having a look at them in a second. There's, uh, yeah, William Fence and Melania Gates Foundation, uh, Blatvik uh, Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford, some organization called Cross Boundary, uh, an organization called CSIS in Washington, D.C., who are not just any old organization. We'll, as we'll see, there's some major power brokers in there. Um, there's the US Agency for International Development, the Lawrence Ellison Foundation. Oh, and what's this? The Microsoft Philanthropies, APAC, that is the Asia Pacific countries. And then there's also Microsoft, Microsoft Philanthropies, MEA, that's the Middle East and Africa division. So uh, as far as I can see, uh, Blair, Blair's Institute is receiving backing from, you know, the Fence Foundation itself, from Microsoft in Asia, and from Microsoft in Africa and the Middle East as well. Nice one, Tony. Um, then there's the Nathan Associ Associates London Overseas Development Institute, the Rockefeller Foundation, 
uh, Social Finance UK and UBS Optimus Foundation. So we're going to be having a look at each of these. Now, obviously, this African government partners, we can't, you know, there's not a list of those. So we can only guess as to who they are. But all of the others uh, here have their own website. So let's have a look at the African Center for Economic Transformation. What is this partner of the Tony Blair Institute and what are they up to? So if you click on the African Center for Economic uh, Translation, you know, there are all these uh, fancy graphics and maps and visions for the world uh, here. And you can see it's all about, uh, oh, look, uh, Agenda 2063. What's that? What's Agenda 2063 then, uh, Tony? Um, so you can have a look into that at your, in, in your own time. But you can see there's, uh, you know, this whole network of uh, these kind of almost nameless, uh, faceless multinational NGOs that are working towards uh, all sorts of uh, agendas, quite a, out in the open here. And um, let's just have a look to see if these people have, oh, look, they're partner organizations. So who is funding the African Center for Economic Transformation? Well, it's the Coca-Cola Foundation, MasterCard, the Ford Foundation, US Aid from the American People, uh, okay, the Open Society Foundation. So that's, that's uh, George Soros's people, the Rockefeller Foundation, who are also backing Blair, remember? Oh, yes, and it's the William Fence and Melania Gates Foundation yet again, and the government of the Netherlands. So, so there we go. It's uh, taxpayers of, uh, of, of Holland, uh, people sending charity monies from the USA, and then a bunch of uh, foundations from massive companies, you know, um, quite if J.D. Rockefeller and Henry Ford would have known that their money would go towards these sorts of things, who knows? But that's what those foundations are used for these days. And there's Fence, his finger in this pie as well. So this is just the first of them. And we see when you click through, much of the same, many of the same names are there. So let's uh, have a look at the next one. So uh, next one is AGRA. That's the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Poor old Africa. They haven't even had their industrial revolution yet. And they're planning their green revolution. So here's AGRA. What do they do? They, they, they have partnerships for strategic transformation. They do policy engagement. Yeah, yeah. And there's all these nice graphics, uh, smallholder farmers. And you know, look, there's a flow of, uh, flow of money that they claim. They, they help 18 countries, apparently, uh, as, long as, they, as long as they farm in ways that are, are approved by the, uh, you know, by the various backers. So anyway, I'm sure they good, uh, they do good work and they're not dodgy or anything. So let's have a look at their partnerships of Agra. Oh, here we go. Let's have a look. Uh, what are the partnerships then? Why do they partner? Okay, so they've got a lot of backers. Uh, from the private sector, we've got uh, many different corporations pledge their money. IBM, I can see in there, and uh, oh look, there's Microsoft. They give money, and uh, var various other ones. Volkswagen, I can see. There's so many different companies. Tata Africa, the Africa CEO Forum. But if you have a look at the actual companies involved there, the big ones are IBM, Microsoft. Um, you know, they don't say how much money they get, but I'm sure you could find out. And then they've got technical partners. Um, yeah, they've got technical partners, uh, including KPMG, various universities, Imperial College. So these are these are actually going to be some of the experts they bring in to help them do these things. Cross boundary look, another Blair special. You can see the cross boundary, um, and then we have uh, government state actors. So these are just kind of various African, you know, African governments, and then. Uh, government of Israel as well, apparently. They're just thrown in there, you know. Um, and then uh, they get finance from these people. And then uh, you see, oh, I didn't click on this top link here, the foundations. Oh, look, William Fence and Mel Melinda Gates Foundation. Brilliant. Um, who's this? That's the Foreign Commonwealth and Development. 
So that's the UK government, UK aid, the Rockefeller Foundation, the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, the MasterCard Foundation. Is anybody noting, noting oh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands? So, you know, the, uh, the Dutch ta taxpayers at it again. Um, so you notice that a lot of a lot of these uh, a lot of these NGOs have the same backers. It's the same few all the time. Apparently, there's a IKEA Foundation as well. So um, that's that one. So what was the next one? Oh, next we have the Anti Defamation League or the ADL, um, and uh, of course they're famous for uh, fighting uh, anti-Semitism all around the world. And uh, let's see, I mean, I've never actually been on this site. They cel they're celebrating LGBTQ plus Pride Month at the moment. Uh, you can report uh, incident of uh, anti-Semitism, extremism, or hate. You can track incidents around the world, uh, report cases of anti-Jewish vandalism if you want on their website. Um, and I actually had a look at all these sites before I came on, and it was quite um, it was quite tricky to find like who their backers are um but one thing uh, you know there's plenty of ways to uh support them with don donations and things like that and you can take action but in terms of like well who are they who are these people who who who's behind them um so you have to uh yeah here we go who we are and then you can click like our leadership and staff or our board of directors what was interesting going through this board of directors um, uh, here, you know, there's uh, Jonathan Greenblatt is the CEO, Esther Epstein, you know, various people. Yeah, you'd expect most of these people to be there. Um, Tony Schneider. But who is the ADL's special advisor for global affairs? Get ready, everyone. It's the Dark Lord himself is the special advisor for global affairs for the ADL. So, uh, was anybody aware of that before uh, before doing this little deep dive? I don't think you were. So, yet again, uh, when I say this man has his finger in every pie, I really do mean he has his finger on every button of power that exists. So there we go. Uh, let's carry on. So the next... Um, <laughs> The next uh, organization is the, uh, the the William Fence and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, they're a nonprofit fighting poverty, disease, and inequity all around the world. Here's uh, pictures of various uh, Africans, uh, you know, sharing uh, icons and things like that. Um, there's a uh, there's old Fence himself doing charitable works. Uh, yeah. Um, so if we have a look, they're prioritizing gender equality and uh, build back stronger uh, from the pandemic. Uh, here's how they're going to do it. And there's all this, uh, there's all these things. Here are some facts. They've given out 1,869 grants, $5.1 billion. Uh, and they've given those grants to 1,190 grantees. They set up 37 program strategies and they uh, employ 1.6 thousand people. And uh, actually, it was very difficult to find out any other info about these. Of all the websites, this was one of the one of the least uh, informative as to who's involved. Um, I think you can pick up like a database of their grants, but it's all like hidden. You know, there's a there, there's you have to kind of really dig to find like who they've given money to, basically. Um, Let's have a look to see if I can. It's the financials page. Let's have a look. Uh, so here are their audited financials for last year. Let's have a look to see if we can. Uh, okay, the KPMG did the audit for them. Fair enough. All right. They've given. Okay, this is assets in thousands. So this is like 158. Six hundred and forty six thousand thousand. So it's about what fifteen million, fifteen bit it's a lot of money. Um here we go, look. A lot of assets. But does it say who they gave all their money to? That's my question. Does it have a list of 
all of this. It's very difficult to find out information about these guys. They're extremely cagey. Um, you find them cropping up on other people's websites, but I haven't really seen like who they're giving their money to. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, yeah, look, it doesn't actually list where the money went to. It breaks it down in a very general way. Oh, look, we just gave that much money to Global Grants. It doesn't say who they went to. So, yeah, anyway, um, yeah, no list of partners on this site. Uh, yeah, you don't really get anywhere uh, when you try to find out about them. So, but as you can see, they're all over the place. So far, we've looked at one, two, three, four different places, five, including the Tony Blair Institute, and they've been on all of them, apart from the EDL, uh, from what I've seen so far. So the next one is the uh, Blavatnik School of Government for uh, Oxford University. And again, you can see, uh, you know, a world better led, better served and better governed. So yet again, they're, they're very high on their globalist agenda. Um, you know, all about uh, all about the vaccine uh, policy and COVID, etc. Um, and again, it's all about it's all about um, you know, reinvigorating third world countries um, and post Brexit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, I couldn't find uh, much in terms of like who their backing is, but it's the University of Oxford, and you know, it's one of these um, one of these like little think institutes within the within the University of Oxford, and it looks good, doesn't it? If you have this uh, as a, as a partner, it's a lot of prestige on it, so. The next, um, the next uh, Blair partner is Cross Boundary, and we have a look at like who these people are. These seem to be like energy specialists. Cross Boundary, they work uh, in advisory, they work in energy, they work in energy access. And uh, as you can see, you know they're all for saw old uh, Saint George there, and uh, and yet again, it's all about helping Africa in various different ways, uh, you know supports the Prosper Africa conference in Tunisia. So there's a lot of this stuff that seems to be geared towards like helping African governments um, according to all of their all of their bump anyway. If you have a look, um, uh, I didn't really see much of a much of a kind of they don't they don't list out their partners like a lot of other places. They do list who's on their team though, I think. Let's have a look. Um, and there you go. It's all this, all these icons everywhere. This is their vision. Line go up with sustainable growth. There's their values. Look, There's, and all of these sites, if you've noticed, have these icons and kind of meaningless value statements, don't they? Uh, there are their virtues, and that's it. That's uh, that's who they are. <laughs> so um, yeah, none the wiser, basically, as to as to what uh, cross boundary are about but you can see they're plugged into this network you've seen them listed everywhere as well okay so there's a cross boundary then uh there's this uh ci csis the center for strategic and international studies uh, in washington dc and uh you know they they are you know, into cybersecurity, uh, they're talking about the Middle East, they're talking about uh, geopolitical strategy. Um, and basically, if you have a look as to see who these people are, um, it's basically Neocon Central. So if you click on uh, the About Us, who's on the About Us? Well, Thomas uh, Pritzker, John J. Hamare, and then if you click on the leadership, uh, We've got a board of trustees who sits on the board of trustees then. Um, so the, uh, the aforementioned uh, CEO and chairman, Sam Nunn, there's uh, there's Hamre, Brendan Bechtel, and then you go down here and you'll start recognizing some some names. So, um, you know, Evan Greenberg, Maurice Greenberg, um, John Hess, so you go down here and you look you look out like a Henry Kissinger. There he is. Um, you know the Carlisle Group, 
you see all who all these people are and generally uh you'll find that they have been rabid uh, paul ryan look um just a rabid neocons basically all down the line these are just this is a this is a neocon wonderland this uh the csis very powerful group and uh, of course you know they um they're plugged into tony blair's network as well why wouldn't they be so then we carry on going down blair's list of associates here and we have the u.s agency for international development uh you recognize this this is the the u.s aid from the american people who saw that on all of those african ones uh, he works uh, with them as well uh, they advance uh, U.S. national security and economic prosperity. Yet another one of the every single one of these NGOs, by the way, has like uh, African women. They have a uh, bit on COVID. They've got bits on generating hope. They've got bits on, you know, diversity, equality and inclusion. They've got a bit on climate change. They've got these kind of horrible icons everywhere, like the, the, the woman icon. Um, so there it is, and then you can partner with them if you want, you know, see what this brings up. Yeah, you can partner with them. And it's all about uh, all the time, you know, all the same stuff. Uh, so let, is there a list of partners of uh, of this group? Let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look who the list of partners are. So... <sighs> Can you see a list of partners in all of this? All right, I'm back. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry, I. Um, it seems like the Dark Lord, the Dark Lord was on to me. I was uh, going into places I shouldn't have, and. Uh, <laughs> The um, trying to find out the list of organizations who work with uh, US aid was too much, too much. Um, but anyway, I've, I think I've, uh, I think I've got it back. So let's, uh, let's do this. Hold on. Uh, all right. So the list of NGOs working with uh, US aid. Let's have a look who's in here then. Ah. Um, oh. Oh, so even after we've got in, it's, it's giving you a way to work with them, but it's not actually listing who they are, unfortunately. God damn it, damn it. Doesn't tell me who's donors. Does it tell, say who the donors are? No. All right, so we're, they're not actually going to let us see who the NGOs and donors and see that these ones are keeping it stum like who's who's involved. So it's keeping us out. Privately funded organizations. Not listing them. Not listing them. Okay. Fair enough. But you can only imagine who would be in there. So let's uh, carry on then with the uh, with the Blair Griff Network, and next it's the Lawrence uh, Lawrence Ellison Foundation. So what's the Lawrence Ellison Foundation? Oh, the Lawrence and Ellison Foundation was abruptly shut down. Apparently, what's this then? Oracle billionaire has made a drastic decision. So we can focus on, so this foundation has been shut down, apparently. Is this it? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Okay, so the Lawrence Ellison one is obviously gone. Um, so let's carry on. Here is the Microsoft Philanthropies APAC. This is their Asia Pacific one. Oh, God. Um, so you can't even... So what's Microsoft Philanthropies? Let's have a look. Uh, okay. 
what's this bit then? The Microsoft Philanthropies. So this is just like an actual division of Microsoft itself, but you can't really see much else other than it's uh, yeah, look completely opaque. So who knows how much money comes from out of Microsoft to go into that? So there it is. Uh, I'm guessing the other ones. There is Nathan Associates London. Who are these people? Nathan Associates Limited. Who are they? Is it these? Trusted global partner for sound analytic and economic solutions. Nathan awarded William Fence and Melania Gates Foundation funded grant. I think it's looking like it's these guys, doesn't it? It looks like them, doesn't it? So let's have a look to see who they are. And yet again, they're helping Africans. Surprise, surprise. Um, uh, who are they then? Here we go. Another bunch of uh, faceless execs here behind all of this. Um, so there you go. Jessica Horwitz and uh, Jennifer Finelib. <laughs> Finelib. Um, interesting. Yes. Uh, now, is there a list of affiliates? Let's have a look. Uh, Okay, so they're all like academics working working with Nathan. But they do a lot of this kind of economic policy, global regulation, feasibility, sustainability. I mean, it's just like every other NGO that we've looked at, isn't it? I wonder how much money flows into their coffers uh, by way of uh, William Fence and his friends. Mm. What are the benefits that you get for... Nathan offers a generous compensation package with highly global benefits for full-time staff. Oh, good. Okay. Clients. Oh, here we go. Here's a list of clients. Who are the clients of Nathan? Let's have a look. Their clients include the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. Agency for International Development, UK Foreign Government and Commonwealth Office, yep. Millennium Challenge for Corporation. Oh yes, the US Department of Agriculture, the US Department of Justice, the US Department of Interior, the US uh, Bankruptcy Courts. Brilliant. The World Bank, mm, the United Nations. I see. Very good. So you can see what's happening here. The you know, the money from William Fence and Co. gets pumped into here. Then various government agencies and departments contract Nathan to work with them. And lo and behold, Nathan, you know, they do all the sorts of things that our old, uh, old Dark Lord and uh, his friends want to do. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting the way this all works. You know, we've talked about how there's no real difference between um you know the big corporations and the government these days but this layer of ngos in the middle is the thing that kind of creates this buffer for them because it then looks like it's independent expert advice even though it's blatantly all being funded by the same people all around the world all around the world how many of these have we seen now and these are the ones just connected to Tony blair so let's carry on there's the Overseas Development Institute. Let's see what these guys get up to. There it is, the ODI, prestigious uh, fellowship. Uh, mobilizing, I shouldn't really accept my cookies onto, the, onto these. Oh look, there's a, is that Boris? Uh, yeah, okay, who are they then? They're talking about COVID, they're talking about the climate crisis, they're talking about the G7. Who are they then? Our strategy, our work, our experts. Who are their experts? So here's another list of these people. Don't recognize any of them, but uh, who like, who gives them money? Who are they? That's, that's what I want to know. Our finances, let's have a look. How are we funded? View details of our funders. Over 1,000 pound funders. Okay, so there's their staff salaries. 
they've got 13 people on they've got one person who's on 140k all right yeah ashley wang is the finance director but like who funds you as uh that guy uh, from the iea always says well who are the oh let's have a look the number two the number one funder who gave 13 million pounds is some organization called the dfd we'll have a look at them in a second okay let's remember them the dfd but the number two the number two funder is william fence and then let's uh let's go deeper the ikea foundation we've seen them around haven't we uh, the Swedish Development Cooperative Agency. Oh, yeah. Okay. So all of these foundations, and you notice how even though these are meant to be NGOs, they're meant to be non-governmental organizations, you notice how various different governments pump money into them. USAID, look, remember them? USAID give money. So they all give money to each other. Um, very interesting. The UN Women funnels money to these guys not a much not that much it has to be said but it's still 126 grand um so there we go oxfam has given some money to them so i mean it's worth bearing in mind um when you're giving money to various charities like where does the money end up is it going to end up with uh with somebody like these guys so anyway who are the dfd so now my next question now Oh, the DFD is literally the, U the UK government's Department for International Development. So the Overseas Development Institute, who are strategic partners of Tony Blair's, um, is, you see, it's an NGO, but they're an NGO who receive 14 million pounds from the UK government directly, you see? Um, and then their second biggest donor is William Fence himself. So so i mean when we ask questions like how does tony blair have so much power hopefully this is starting to make a bit more sense now so the next strategic partner of mr blair's is the rockefeller foundation now the rockefeller foundation give uh, money to, and again notice the ubiquitous icon style the ubiquitous uh, kind of you know children in africa iconography climate you know it's all the same on all of these websites might as well be the same uh, from what i've seen that there's a, how many indian women have we seen doing textiles work so far um so let's uh, see if we can find out any more information about these guys before i get out of here i'll check to see if there's been any super chats in a second so collaborations our work in africa our work in asia co-impact I mean, who are they working with? There we go. Uh, okay. Yet again, it's not that easy to find. Let's have a look down here. Grants. Uh, yet again, this 990 PF document, just like the William Fence one, doesn't actually probably not going to tell us who they've actually sent money to it'll just be like oh we gave this much in grants and it doesn't break it all down for you so but anyway the rockefeller i mean they're just like the, the you know the bill and melania foundation um whether jd rockefeller would have supported these things is another question but uh next there's so social finance uk now who, who are these another ngo social finance Hmm. don't think i will accept that i mean i should i should have been saying no to all of these cookies shouldn't uh can you hear me again sorry sorry we keep this stream is obviously being striped by the dark lord's minions today uh, i don't know what's happening really but um uh hopefully uh we didn't lose too much and we're going to be looking at social finance now social finance yes so um yeah, so let's uh, let's have a look now at social finance. I was going to have a look at their partners, David Blood, Sir Ronald Cohen, Lord Fink, Bernard Horn, Phil Hume, um, and then who who's who's uh, who are the partners? 
APEC, APAX, these are these are a big uh, financial institution, Comic Relief. Okay, so there's a different uh, bunch here. Looks like yeah, national. This is a very UK focused one, I can tell. Stanley and Barbara Fink Foundation. Okay, Rockefeller Foundation. There we go. So uh, yeah, RNS Cohen Foundation, Lloyd's Bank Foundation. You know, a lot of a lot of sneaky money going uh, go into this one. Um, now they're a charity, a charity group. Uh, I mean, it's not to say that everything these people do is dark, but uh, you've got to wonder. You've got to wonder. And uh, there we see all of these, all of these things. And there you can see the actual people on the ground are much younger, who uh, who control them. So yeah, this is yet another one that uh, that old Blair is uh, connected with, and. Uh, there are various different groups all over the place. Um, all right, so let's have a look at the last one, the UBS Optimus Foundation. Then we'll have a look at some super chats, and I'll see you later on for unpopular opinion. So, the UBS Optimus Foundation, obviously UBS are a big, uh, big uh, European bank uh, based in Germany, I believe. Um, and uh, what, what do they get up to then? They do positive change. Oh, yeah, look, more Indian, more Indian women, COVID. Yeah, yeah. Ah, innovative teaching in Africa. Yeah, it's all for a good cause. It's all for a good cause. Um, and uh, this is yet another one of Tony Blair's uh, Tony Blair's friends. I mean, uh, they have very little information. These guys, very little information. Barely, barely anything at all on who these guys are, how much money they give. So there it is. Um, I mean, you can see their back archives. I mean, it's just like stories, basically, giving details of their various projects and how many donors they had and things like that. So anyway, hopefully this was, uh, you know, this elite. I mean, lots of you will have had an idea that these sorts of things go on uh, already. But uh, hopefully it was a bit of a, you know, Bit of an eye opener for everybody uh, who wasn't aware of this. Uh, yeah, people are saying it's all for money laundering. I mean, I think charity gets is tax dedu is tax deductible, you know, tax deductible. Um, but let's have a quick look at some uh, super chats, um, and uh, then we'll get out of here. And I'll be back for unpopular opinions later on. So, uh, Judge uh, Caligula Bushman says. The Dutch government actually sponsors NGOs that start court cases against themselves to push legislation around the parliament. Look up postcode Luteri. Blair is also deep in that subversive organization. Yeah, I mean, I noticed the Dutch government were all over these uh, NGOs. They seem to back every single one going. So the Yorkie one says global power without responsibility, little mainstream media scrutiny. The Dark Lord moves in mysterious ways. I mean, it's not the Dark Lords just our way into this. I mean, think of all the people we haven't heard of who are part of these networks. These are the people secretly, like, you know, pushing the agendas behind the scenes. And nobody, you know, when was the last time you saw a BBC do a deep dive on who the hell all these people are? Alderman says it's all very sus. Tony Blair is the imposter. And uh, Chu Chulian says actual journalism. What is this? I mean. I wouldn't call it journalism. It it was just looking on these people's websites and following links on their own websites. So, you know, um, yeah. And as we've looked, as we've looked more into this, it really does seem it really does seem like Blair is is a kind of public face to all of this. He's just like the front man to sell it to the public. Whereas, um, you know, a lot of these actors behind the scenes. I mean, the thing is about William Fence they were connected to all of them and they were giving huge amounts of money as we saw. But what about these governments who are giving money to these organizations? That's taxpayers' money they're giving. You know, what about all those foundations that we haven't heard of? Who's controlling the Coca-Cola Foundation? Who's controlling the Rockefeller Foundation? So, uh, so, so anyway, hopefully uh, that's, uh, that should be informative. 
and I'll see you later on for Unpopular Opinions. Get out. Yes, I've got a lot to talk about today. What's my number one favourite person in the world? The Dark Lord, old Teflon Tone, been up to this week? Well, that's right. It's Sunday, and here in the UK, that means former Prime Minister Anthony B. Lyre himself automatically makes it to the front page of every major newspaper just by opening his mouth. I've been tracking this for weeks. And he does it every single Sunday. Only this time, it's quite newsworthy, given that he's called the alleged President of the United States, rightly, an imbecile. Now, before you start getting all based to Blair about this, let me remind you that Blair's entire strategy, always and at all times, is to flank his opposition in a manner that seems to come from the right. In fact, he published this piece in the Mail on Sunday, Britain's nominally most right-wing newspaper. To put it in context for American viewers, this is the publication that Peter Hitchens writes for. Let's look past the fact that this murderous bar steward got us into this mess in the first place and think about on how many fronts the Dark Lord is pushing for the forces of evil here all at once. Let me count the ways. First, he is doing the bidding, as he always has, of the neocons. There isn't a forever war that Blair hasn't supported from Bosnia to Iraq to Afghanistan to Syria and whatever else. And so, of course, he spots a chance here to gaslight the public into wanting us to stay in Afghanistan for longer. He's already saying that jihadis around the world are cheering and playing up on the war on terror angle. Do you remember that? However, from the American perspective, this gives all his old buddies in Washington and all those think tanks and all their buddies over in the mainstream media over there the chance to say, look at the international condemnation. And they can hold up a front page and they can see a man of Blair's fame and stature calling the president an imbecile. And this will play. It will play on Fox as well as MSNBC and CNN. It will play. This is all grist to the neocon mill, domestically in the UK, domestically in the US, and also internationally. Note, by the way, that the source for all this, yes, he printed it in the uh, Mail on Sunday, but it also went out in the Associated Press Newswire. That means it went from AP to all news sources around the world on Sunday. Anyway, that's just the first dark manoeuvre. But there is a second one. Blair has ruled himself out for making a comeback, which means he is definitely trying to make a comeback. Now, let's rewind a moment to the peak of Blair's powers. It is 2003. The Dark Lord has been in powers for six long years at this point, and already he's invaded both Iraq and Afghanistan. He has cozied up to George W. Bush, and this presents a problem for his image at home. You see, all Blair's twat friends in all Blair's twat politically correct circles would really rather he did more to stand up to that brash cowboy W. Not knowing, of course, that Blair was the one who was really keen on war in the first place. That it, in fact, was Blair who was the one who convinced Bush that he could sell the WMD weapons of mass destruction shit to the public. But, you know, they were twats, so what does it matter? Anyway, one of Blair's twat friends and financial supporters was the filmmaker Richard Curtis, who liked to make films starring another one of Blair's twat friends and financial supporters, the actor Hugh Grant. Well, what better way to give Blair's twat friends what they wanted by rewriting the wrongs of reality in fiction by casting Hugh Grant as Tony Blair in Love Actually, the feel-good film of that year. You see, when John Major was in power, all films about Britain in all times and all places showed it as a dreary place. But when Tony Blair was in power, as if by magic from 1997 onwards, 
all films about Britain showed it as an amazing feel-good place, almost like a fairy tale. The dreariness didn't really return, as if by magic, until Austerity Britain under David Cameron in 2010. Sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt this video to go on a rant within a rant here. This situation is ridiculous, if you think about it. Under Major, we got Naked, a Mike Lee black comedy showing the dark undercurrent of Britain. We got Train Spotting, a Danny Boyle black comedy showing what a total and utter shithole Glasgow is. We got Brassed Off, showing some working class people struggle to maintain hope in a Corrie town after the pit closed. We got Full Monty, showing working class people struggle to maintain hope in Sheffield after all the steel factories closed down. Things could only get better, folks. Then, starting just a year later, let's look at some of the utter wank to come out under Blair. Notting Hill, a feel-good comedy set in a London that no one has ever seen. East is East, a multicultural feel-good comedy. Shakespeare in Love, an utterly vapid cringe fest targeted squarely at Americans and suits. About a boy. Actually, this one was kind of okay, but still basically the first world problems of a first world wanker. Bend it like Beckham. Another feel-good wank fest, only this time about women playing football and other progressive themes. Who could forget the pseudo-profundity of sliding doors? Oh, how sophisticated you all were. Fucking crap. Bridget Jones's diary. As if the hardest problem in Britain in 2001 was who to snog, Hugh Grant or Colin Firth. Core blimey, eh? Ladettes, eh? Fucking cattle, a lot of you. I mean, what happened to Mike Lee and Danny Boyle and all those left-wing filmmakers from 1997 to 2010? What, what were they fucking doing for, the, for that 13 years? Life was just wonderful, was it? Because, uh... Blair and Brown opened a few job centres or whatever. Jokes, the lot of them. Anyway, in Love Actually, our hero, Hugh Tony Blair Grant, actually finds the nerve to stand up to the US president to wild applause from his adoring, fawning fans. Now, let's fast forward to 2021. Now, Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister and Tony Blair is just some bloke who sits on a few boards and runs a few NGOs and who still has the same friends in the media as he did 20 years ago and the same friends in Washington. Boris can't, for obvious reasons, come out and call Biden an imbecile. Obviously, he can't because he's the Prime Minister and, you know, the special relationship, etc. But Blair can. And you see, he's flanking Boris once again, nominally, to the right, in a way that is naturally appealing to all of Boris's supporters, superficially speaking, but for the darkest of reasons. And, mark my words, there will be thousands right this minute, across the country, millions falling for just this bullshit. Third, let's make no mistake, there's no way a man as super-connected as Blair Let's remember, he gets his money directly from the Dark Lord, William Fence himself. He, there's no way that a man like this is taking shots at the king unless the king is being taken out. It looks to me as if they are shoveling as much dirt onto Biden as possible here to find an excuse to get rid of him at the soonest possible convenience, even if it means President Kamala Harris. At this point, they don't care. Why should they? There's no way... You get a major, major shot across the bios like this, heard around the world and sent across Associated Press around the world from a top-level Dark Lord like Blair if Biden's cards are not marked. They are sharpening their knives already. Remember, Pelosi redrafted that 25th Amendment and it was never for Trump. Anyway, since I'm in such a great mood today, it's a good time to announce my long-awaited summer sale on the academic agency, coupon code SUMMER25. I realised today that there's only about a week of summer left. So yes, 25% off all courses at the academic agency until the end of the month. Only not for foundations of research, because one, it's only just come out, and also at £50, I'm basically giving it away. 25% of nothing, well, it can't be done. Nothing comes of nothing, come again. Who said that? Anyway, summer sale, 25% off. Yay. All right. Get out. Friends. Romans. Countrymen. Shh. Come this way. 
Lend me your ears. Secrets of ancient rhetoric can now be yours for a trifling sum. The art of persuasive argument is all around us. In fact, we are surrounded by it. We live in a rhetorical age, but this is seldom taught and even more seldom explained. It is not for you to know, they said. The master of grammar knows how to write with clarity, precision and correctness. The master of logic knows how to disarm his opponents with reason alone. And both can be powerful adversaries. But the master of rhetoric can outflank both, caring as he does little for their rules and even less for their defeated tears. The master of grammar asks, is this sentence correct? Is this sentence clear? The master of rhetoric wonders, does my speech have the power to sway the passions? Can my words move the crowd? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. The master of logic trains his mind to eliminate fallacies and formulate correct and well-defined arguments. The master of rhetoric knows that the reasoning mind can be flooded with emotions, that the flood can short-circuit logic and overwhelm his opponent who will crumple. They will wonder why their well-written, well-reasoned arguments were so defenseless against the rhetor's apparent ability to bend reality to his will. Do the faces in the crowd not see through this dark magic? The master of rhetoric laughed at their wonder. He looked at the bemused, despairing face of the master of logic and spoke. Harness that wonder, my friend. It was your own beloved Socrates who said, the only true wisdom is in knowing that you know nothing. And wonder is the beginning of wisdom. He turned to the master of grammar. So lucid and correct your prose, but why does nobody listen to you? It was your own favourite, George Orwell, who wrote, Perhaps a lunatic was simply a majority of one. Do not rail at the crowd for what is in their nature. Understand what they are, and they will listen to you. And with that, the master of rhetoric was gone. Find out what else he has to say by signing up to Foundations of Rhetoric. Fulfill your destiny and complete the trivium. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.